Hey everyone, uh, in this final part of our little series on the history of numbers, we're going to be going beyond the real numbers to look at the complex numbers and then into less familiar stuff like the quaternions, octonions, hyperreals and surreals until we come to the very edge of the mathematical universe. Let's see what's out there. The first to entertain the actual existence of numbers that allowed for taking the square root of negative real numbers, and who set out rules for dealing with these novelties, was the Italian mathematician Raphael Bombelli. In his Le Algebra, published in 1572, Bombelli became the first European clearly to state ways of doing arithmetic with negative numbers that made sense, such as minus times plus equals minus. But more importantly, he launched the study of what eventually became known as complex numbers by considering solutions of equations such as x cubed equals ax plus b in situations where a over x cubed is bigger than b over x squared. The only way to crack the equation in such a case is to allow the existence of something that's the sum of a real number plus the square root of a negative real number. For well over a century, mention of square roots of negative real numbers met with little enthusiasm among the mathematical cognoscenti. Bombelli was smart enough not to give such things a special name and thereby expose them to even more ridicule. But it wasn't long before imaginary numbers became a term of derision used in an attempt to discredit the whole idea. Unfortunately, the name stuck, and so even today, in these more enlightened times, we refer to the square root of minus one as the unit imaginary number, and represent it by the letter i. Any real number multiples of i, such as 5i, pi i, or i square root of two, which is equal to the square root of minus two, are known as imaginary numbers, even though they're as real as real numbers. The sum of a real number and an imaginary number is known as a complex number. Again, complex is a misnomer because it implies complexity in the everyday sense of being difficult or complicated, which isn't the case at all. Historically, complex numbers took off and in time became accepted because they proved useful as intermediate steps in obtaining real number answers to problems. It's true that we don't need them in everyday maths, we can even get by for the most part without having to know about negative numbers. Why would we need to worry about dealing with an I number of things? Hardly any of us use imaginary numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, but all of us depend on others who do know about and use them because these numbers are crucial in many fields of modern-day physics and engineering. They're used by electrical engineers as a method of representing alternating current and are unavoidable in areas of physics such as the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, which underpins our understanding of the world at the atomic and subatomic level. This relevance in science arises because complex numbers have some very useful mathematical properties. For instance, polynomials such as x squared plus one equals zero may not always have a solution among the real numbers, but will always have a solution in the complex numbers. This fact was first proven by the German mathematician Carl Gauss in 1799, and is so important it's known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. Surely with complex numbers we've reached the end of the road in terms of what's mathematically possible, but no, far from it. Larger even than the system of complex numbers are other systems so vast that the only way to understand them is to venture into a strange land known as abstract algebra. This esoteric realm of maths, especially appealing to those who enjoy building their own private thought universes, describes in the broadest sense sets, collections of things, upon which certain well-defined operations can be performed. One type of object studied in abstract algebra is the group. Another is the ring, which has nothing to do with circles, but is instead a set on which two operations are defined. 
These operations share the same properties as the addition and multiplication with which we are familiar. To be precise, when it comes to rings, addition must be associative and there must be both an identity and an additive inverse. The multiplication of rings also has to satisfy several conditions. The natural numbers don't form a ring because there's no additive identity or additive inverse. Zero isn't a natural number nor are negative numbers. But the integers do form a ring. Other rings include the rationals, the reals and the complex numbers and there are many other examples. Abstract algebra can help us to define new systems of numbers and classify them based on whether they're rings or some other type of mathematical object. We can find rings that aren't simple extensions of the integers and we can also find much larger systems of numbers. One of these is the Quaternions, discovered in 1843 by the Irish mathematician William Hamilton. Complex numbers can be represented on a two-dimensional plane on which the x-axis represents real numbers and the y-axis imaginary numbers. Hamilton wondered whether a larger system than complex numbers could be represented in 3D space. He struggled to find one but eventually hit upon quaternions, which can be pictured as existing in a space of four dimensions. In a moment of inspiration while strolling across Broom Bridge in Dublin, the formula I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals IJK equals minus one flashed into his mind, along with the realization that there weren't just two possible square roots of minus one, I and minus one, but six. In fact, we now know that there are infinitely many square roots of minus one. Quaternions never caught on widely, but have proved their worth for some applications, even though they remain more obscure to most people even than complex numbers. In cases where a quaternion consists only of a multiple of i, j and k, it corresponds to a vector, a quantity with size and direction, in 3D space. In fact, a quaternion can be represented as the sum of a vector and a scalar, with the scalar being the real number part. This way of representing 3D vectors makes quaternions extremely useful in three-dimensional animations and simulations, where the ability to rotate a perspective is essential. Computer games that have a three-dimensional display, for example, use quaternions to represent such rotations. Inspired by Hamilton's discovery, fellow Irish mathematician John Graves came up with yet another new system of numbers which he called octonions. He was slow to publish his findings, however, and was put to the post by the Englishman Arthur Cayley, who introduced octonions to the world in 1845. Octonions are sums of multiples of one and seven other values often simply called E1, E2, all the way up to E7. They satisfy the equality E1 squared equals E2 squared equals all the way up to E7 squared equals minus one. But for multiplying two distinct octonions, a much more complicated multiplication table is required. Obscure though they are, Octonions have found some applications at the cutting edge of physics in the highly mathematical subject of string theory. Even now we haven't reached the limits of what's possible with number systems or the imaginations of mathematicians. Ways have been found to extend the real number line to include both the infinitely large and the infinitely small. In the system of what are called hyperreal numbers, an infinitely large number, omega, and an infinitely small number, or infinitesimal, epsilon, are added to the real numbers. These are related by the fact that epsilon equals 1 over omega. Multiples of omega and epsilon are allowed as well, so that, for example, 3 omega plus pi minus epsilon root 2 is a hyperreal number. There are hyperreals such as omega squared, which is greater than any real multiple of omega, and epsilon squared, which is smaller than any real multiple of epsilon. 
Because it's possible to add, subtract, multiply and divide them, hyperreals form a field in the same way that rational and real numbers do. They can also be ordered because we can define what it means for a hyperreal to be greater than another. So they're known as an ordered field. Some other fields, like the field of complex numbers, aren't ordered. How, for example, can we tell whether i is greater than or less than zero when it lies to the side of our number line? The richest extension of the real numbers, which includes infinities and infinitesimals, is known as the surreal numbers. The surreals take the concept of Dedekind cuts to its logical extreme. They're represented in the form LR, where L and R are sets of surreal numbers previously constructed in such a way that all members in L are less than any in R. The new surreal number then has to lie between these sets, being greater than all members of L and less than all members of R. We can generate the whole inconceivably vast universe of the surreals effectively out of thin air. To construct the first one, both L and R must be the empty set, the set that contains no members. This gives us the surreal number which corresponds to zero. With zero in place, it can be used in the sets L and R to produce more surreals. The next two to be constructed are minus one and one, moving on to two, to three, and so on. All fractions where the denominator is a power of two, known as dyadic rationals, can be expressed in the surreals in a finite number of steps. But a system that includes just dyadic rationals isn't very powerful. It can't even express all rationals, let alone all reals. The big breakthrough happens when we allow an infinite number of steps. After infinitely many steps, once all dyadic rationals have been constructed, one extra step is enough to create all the real numbers. It turns out that while Dedekind originally used all rational numbers in his Dedekind cuts, it's enough to use just the dyadic rationals. The reals, however, aren't the only new surreal numbers to be created. In fact, epsilon and omega are also made at the same time. In the case of epsilon, L contains zero and R contains all previously created positive surreals, all the dyadic rationals. Meanwhile, for omega, L contains all already existing surreals, so omega is larger than all of them. Minus epsilon and minus omega are also defined, as are x plus epsilon and x minus epsilon for all dyadic rationals x. Later on, some other surreal numbers can be constructed. Once we have omega, we can have omega minus 1 and omega plus 1, and also a whole host of other numbers, such as pi plus e. L consists of pi, R consists of pi plus 1, pi plus a half, pi plus a quarter, and so on. And some like root omega, where L consists of 1, 2, 3, and so on, while R contains omega, omega over 2, omega over 3, and so on. Surreal numbers are the largest possible ordered field. They ultimately contain not only all reals, but all hyperreals, and even a vast hierarchy of ever greater infinities. So mind-bogglingly huge is the number of surreals that there's no infinity large enough to contain all of them. There are so many surreal numbers that they form a proper class. There's no set large enough to contain them all. Thanks very much for watching this mini-series on the history of numbers. I do hope you'll subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you again very soon to discover more maths.